Hello and welcome to Earth Heart Network Radio, the land to mouth food, farm and garden edition that comes your way live in studio every week. And this week we are very honored and uh, just so excited to be sharing the special edition with you. We've got a whole panel today. Not only do we have Patrick Battle, as always, for This Week in the Garden, we also have special guests, Joe Hollis and Margot Rossi, and we're going to have a Chinese medicine focalized show. We're going to get a whole insight about that from a wellness perspective from Margot, and then we're going to get a whole deep understanding from Joe Hollis, the owner and operator of Mountain Gardens and wonderful herbalist and Chinese herb expert. He'll give us the plant perspective on that, on what to do and grow. And uh, Pat's going to start out. They are all sort of neighbors up there near Burnsville, North Carolina, and are just up the road from each other for many, many years. And that's how these great relationships have formed to bring us here today. So Pat, I'll turn it over to you now to give us more insight into these two folks and what our conversation is about today. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I am so excited to have both you, Margo and Joe, on today. Um, you have a, a range of skill sets between you that I think is going to be most pertinent to what's happening right now. Um, as I was getting ready to do this, I realized that even with Margo, who is my doctor, um, who I go to whenever I go to a doctor, I realized that I, I am incredibly resistant to going to doctors and twice in my adult life had things wrong with me that I didn't understand what they were. Once it was um, shingles and the other time it was um, sciatica and most people would rush right to their doctor and I basically had progressed my way through most the way, all the way through the shingles without going to a doctor and most of the way through sciatica without going to a doctor and then finally at you know the recommendation of a co-worker, I went to an acupuncturist and immediately had relief with my um, sciatica. However, and this is why I thought it was important I give a little introduction, I had to let go of my take on what was wrong with me. Even though I was certain it was sciatica, that is not how my practitioner at the time spoke to me about it. I didn't have to worry that, that she understood what was wrong with me because the treatment she gave me the needles she was placing were all along my sciatic nerve. So I had no doubt that, you know, what she was doing was right. Um, and the and the effect was immediate. You know, I had been in such pain that at one point I fainted um, and I had immediate relief, you know, moments after getting off the table. Um, and yet had I judged what she was doing to me, had she described what she was going to do ahead of time and I had judged whether or not I wanted treatment, the way I have learned to think about medicine, even though I'm, you know, incredibly alternative and hardly ever even go to doctors, et cetera, et cetera, and always trying to cure myself, probably would have made me wonder about whether I should do it because I didn't really get the terminology at all. And I was real worried when we were discussing this that that could happen. Actually, when I, I got a chance just before this show started to see uh, Margo's outline, I don't think it's even going to be a problem. But I want to encourage people to just listen and wait till it makes sense to you. It won't take very long. And I know why I worried about this is that we've had a couple of biodynamic presenters and some of them immediately are understood, but other ones, people kind of glaze over before they open up enough to get what biodynamics is about because the language is very different even though what they're actually speaking to are truths that we all know and understand. And I can't tell you what a joy it's been to be treated by Margot because we were not in the room where she was, you know, first just checking in with me and seeing what I was about and doing that kind of patient intake before we both quickly got that we, although we're doing somewhat different things, I would argue they're not as different as some people might think, um, we both quickly got that we were guided by nature and that all of the wisdom that we natural world. And I love that about Chinese medicine. Um, you know, it's interesting as I've been di diving deep in my very amateur way to see that there are even different variations on certain formulas such as jade windscreen and to speculate as to whether or not that is re in response to changing times if the practitioners are responding. And I know I'm pretty bad for wanting to find any herb that's efficacious and just apply it. 
and I'm also pretty bad, as my wife Diane says, for wanting to marshal a huge array of different things, all of which have an impact, and just throw everything, you know, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Um, <laughs> but Mar Margo's wisdom and the wisdom of her, her discipline is that every herb has an effect and they must all be balanced. And so it's pretty rare, Margo, correct me if I'm wrong, that a Chinese remedy is going to be one herb. Um, and it's all directed by an overall philosophy, which is very old and very wise. And now, as I'm looking at this very scary pandemic, has a huge array of tools that are used. And indeed, Margo and Joe cured Diane, my wife, of something, we don't know what it was because people can't get tested these days, that was flu-like and very quickly with an array of herbs and a protocol that was more than one treatment in a matter of less than 24 hours. Um, and so I am very confident that this is a way to go. Um, and I'm actually kind of heartbroken that we can't reach the medical community with tools we have. I just came across from uh, Mark Cohen, who has been a presenter here, sent me a protocol that a bunch of doctors are using that's like using lots of vitamin C early on and then treating the patient with um, cort cortisone type drugs, cortisone, corticosteroids, I guess, cortisteroids, I guess um, they're called, um, to suppress the cytokine storm inflammation. And I sent it to my sister who's on the front lines and struggling incredibly in Pennsylvania as a nurse in charge of infectious disease control in a nursing home, hoping she'll have time to see it. And mentioned that, you know, the second part of that treatment, I know that Chinese medicine can approach um, and much more gently without all the side effects from those steroids. And yet I know they're not gonna be accepted by um, Western medicine and far, be it, far better that they should save these patients from the damage done by that over response of the immune system with what they know how to use, but it's such a blunt instrument compared to what Chinese medicine has to offer. And, you know, Joe, I haven't really worked with Joe in a long time, though I had the honor of um, spending a season on his farm back in the late 70s and learned a huge amount there. Um, and I can tell you that the depth of Joe's knowledge is astounding. I mean, there are whole realms of knowledge that he has that he's not even applying. You want to talk to him about alpines, you know, <laughs> you know, just, I mean, incredible. And anybody that has the honor to tour through his garden will just be drawn in and amazed. It is such a journey and such a gift. And we are so lucky to have the, the treasure of Joe and Mountain Gardens here in Western North Carolina. And I know that he's gonna inspire us to grow our medicine. And I know he has the knowledge to help us to do that. Um, and has so many resources and is busy making medicine for his community at the moment, making the medicine that they need. So we, we're in Western North Carolina are so very lucky to have Joe. And I think with that, I can say it's time for Margo to take over. Oh, thank you, Pat. That was a beautiful introduction to, to both um, kind of what it's like living in our community that we can all pull together and that we have such tremendous resources where we live. So thank you for that. Um, I feel very honored to be here. I want to just uh, take a moment to breathe into that. Um, here with Pat and Joe and also Lisa, who's heading up the tech portion of our program. Um, we're living in truly extraordinary times. I mean, life on earth has always been extraordinary. We're, we're just in a, we're in an interesting little concentrated moment. So um, part of what I'm going to be talking about today, the resilience of the immune system is knowing the resources that you have in your area and the variety of skill sets that people in your community have. So I just want to thank you all again for being here. Um, I'm going to start my, my screen here. So when Patrick and Joe, or I actually don't remember who had the idea to do this, but when, when this idea was put forth, I'm a licensed acupuncturist and I've been practicing for over 25 years 
I studied herbal medicine in the States and in China, but I don't consider myself an herbalist. Um, I work with herbs with all my patients, uh, but it just isn't where my, my strength really lies compared to some of my colleagues who are amazing herbalists. So what I thought I could best speak to was what I learned through my practice about this thing we call the immune system. And what is that? What, is, what, is, what do we mean when we talk about the immune system? And how do we strengthen it? We hear this so often, how do we strengthening the immune system? But I wanted to explore, what does that mean? What does that mean to a regular person to strengthen the immune system? So there are some hallmarks of a healthy immune system. Many of us would say, oh, if I, if I don't get sick or if I get sick and I get over it fast, I must have a healthy immune system. Still, that doesn't really tell us what is the immune system, unless we go to medical school and learn about all the chemical physiology and the biochemistry and just the anatomy and physiology of the immune system. Uh, but that's not really helpful for those of us who are just trying to figure out what can we do for ourselves during this time and moving forward from this particular virus, because there will be other viruses and other pathogens that we're going to relate to. What can I do for myself through my understanding? And I'd like to just promote that the immune system, all that means is how do I relate to my environment and what I experience in life? When I encounter something in life, am I able to adapt? Am I able to bounce back? Um, am I able to relate to it? And how do I relate to it? One of the cool things about Chinese medicine throughout history each, um, each iteration, each dynasty, each emperor had his own physician. And that physician had a mandate to figure out how to deal with the problems of the times. And of course, throughout times, the health problems varied. They didn't stay the same. Um, for example, when China started leaving mainland China, going out into the world, when those sailors came back, they brought with them new diseases. And so the physician at that time had to deal with all these new things that were coming up that they hadn't ever experienced before. So there's a resilience in the medicine. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why Chinese medicine is so powerful um, to deal with these, these issues that crop up like coronavirus that we don't have an experience of I mean, we've had SARS, the first iteration of SARS, but this one is a little bit different. And it's different enough that what we learned from SARS, we can use, but it's not 100% helpful. We, we have to be able to adapt to the situation. So just to recap, that our immune system is all about our adaptability, our resilience, and our ability to relate so all these different factors in the environment, I've, I've put up a bunch of different slides. Um, what we think, how we live, what we eat, how we relate to each other, our work, our home environment, all these things are, impact us. And the question is, how well can I relate and adapt to them? So this this is a concept, if you go to acupuncture school, which I encourage everyone at some point to get some training in Chinese medicine, even if it's on YouTube, because it's such a tremendous philosophy of life. Um, but if you go to school, the first thing you're going to learn about illness is that it relates to this concept of wind. So as Patrick said, just stay in the saddle with me. You're going to get this because we all know what wind is like. Wind blows in and with it, the weather changes and maybe the seasons change with it. Uh, and we have to roll with it. Whatever the wind brings, we have to deal with. So in Chinese medicine, wind is the harbinger of all dis-ease. We have to, it's going to bring in something new that we're going to have to deal with. So wind is a metaphor for change as our lives change, as our circumstances change, we have to relate and we have to adapt 
and we have the opportunity to build some resilience with it. If you look at this character for wind, you'll see on the outside, it's got this, it looks like a table, and that is the radical for a table. And inside, hiding underneath that table, is the radical for an insect. So thousands of years ago, the Chinese knew that illness had something to do with something that's come in and it got inside of us and it's hiding in there <laughs> and it's causing us to relate to it and how we relate to it is going to show up either as illness or how we get through it, how we, how we shift through the change. Um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that character for table also means how many or indicates a quantity of something. So another concept in Chinese medicine is that the wind brings in more insects. With the wind, the wind blows in new life, something else we're going to have to deal with. So this character for wind, for change, which is the harbinger of disease, has to do with how much of these little pathogens we're going to be having to deal with and relate to. Uh, I want to check in with you guys. Does that make sense, Patrick and Cho? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Yes. I, I yes, good. Get it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think that that'll be that hard for people to get. I think you're good. Okay. Okay. And I'm just checking with Lisa. Your mic is muted, and I don't know if you meant that or if you are speaking to me. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, okay. I was just reading that the severity of coronavirus cases is directly linked to how much exposure they have to the greater number of pathogens, and, and that the more exposure people have, the worse it is, and, and you can have milder cases. So it's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Lisa. You just brought up an important point that's a little bit of an aside, but I think because you brought it up, we should respond to it. Um, when we're thinking about the virulence of a pathogen, there are a few things that are important. One is how strong is that pathogen in and of itself? How much of it are we getting exposed to? How long are we getting exposed to it? And how is our ability to relate to it? How strong is our ability to relate to it? How flexible is our ability to relate to it? All of those factors play a part in how, how well uh, the wind that's carrying the pathogen, how well this change is going to impact us. So a, a variety of factors the strength of the pathogen, how much there is that we get exposed to, how long we're exposed to it, and then our immune system. So thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> These are my, my patients keep asking me questions about how much they should wash their hands, how careful they should be about packages that are coming into the house, should they leave them outside in the sun for many days, should they spray them down with bleach, and so I've just been sharing that, that snippet of information that um, the amount of pathogen on a package um, and how long you're exposed to that, those would all play a role. So not to be too neurotic about your packages is kind of my point. Okay, so here, here we are at wind. Um, feng is just the Chinese, uh, that's the, the word that's used for wind. Fung. Okay, so if you study Chinese medicine, like I said, which I hope you all do, even just a little bit, uh, it's thought that wind rides towards your body and it hits the back of your head, your neck and your upper back area is kind of where the wind blows and gets in. It can also enter through the senses the change. So you can eat something, you can breathe something in. Um, and that, 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 that's another way to transmit the pathogen into the body. But I bring this up because this upper back, upper, this back of the head, neck region, um, 
just for a tip for your own well-being, this is a great place to wear a scarf. It's no, it's no mystery that the Chinese love to bundle up this area of their body because it's an added layer of protection against the wind. And now, um, now our, our government is now saying that, you know, we should be covering our nose and mouth when we go out in public. I can tell you that my fellow acupuncturists have been doing that since the beginning <laughs> because we're, we're aware of and we believe this concept of wind being able to come in through the senses as well. Um, when we get to strategies to how to deal with this wind, we'll talk about ways that you can clear the wind by doing certain self-care practices. And Joe's going to be talking about some of the herbs that can help us disperse the wind. Um, I'll be talking about that a little bit too. So the wind can carry um, two opposing natural forces with it. It can carry cold, which is a yin element, you could say, and it could, or it could carry yang, which tends to be hot. So an example of wind mixing with cold into the body, the symptom would be, I feel cold, I feel chilled. I have a fever, but I feel cold. I can't get warm. I'm bundling up. Um, and as you can see, this woman in the photograph, she looks more stiff, which is also a characteristic of cold. It tends to be more rigid and contracted. The other thing that wind can bring is heat, and that would be more like, oh, my heart feels so hot. Margo. Margo, yeah. you're so expressive, but you're really attacking your microphone a lot. So just oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so just try whenever you're doing because you've done it like three times. So I'm just so we'll take this part out, but just try to do it without actually grabbing yourself. You're such a good actress, but it's just it's like oh, <laughs> oh no, well, and it sounds me. really funny. So I just don't want you to sound like that. But you, I want you to describe everything without actually grabbing your. Throat, okay. <laughs> Do I need to go back and say anything? Well, again? whatever that you last thing you just said, it was really muffled because you were completely okay. covering the mic. Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll I'll, we'll backtrack. So the other thing that wind can bring is heat, and that heat can attack the throat, which can feel like a hot, hot throat, burning throat, sore throat. It can also make you feel hot, like, oh, I gotta take this off. Maybe they're sweating. Maybe you have a fever and you actually feel you have a fever. Um, so that's how this wind can bring in these different ways that we see this virus manifesting in different people. Some people feel cold, some people feel hot. Some people feel cold at first and then it turns to feeling hot. Hot. And that's just about how disease progresses through the body. Uh, but uh, one point I, I would also like to make, though what Joe and um, many in our community are trying to do is become a resource for people that you can tap into. Joe's making formulas and he's going to talk to us about the herbs that have really come forward through the, this short time of research. Um, it's really important, and I'm not just saying this as a sales pitch for your acupuncturist, because this is tricky stuff. It seems simple as we're talking about wind and heat versus wind and cold. Sometimes the signs get mixed, and this virus in particular progresses very quickly between one set of symptoms and another. It's really good to have a practitioner on your team to be working with rather than trying to figure this out for yourself. Um, so that's kind of the yin and yang of what the wind can bring and how that cold will manifest, contracting, rigid, feeling chilled, or the heat can manifest as burning in the throat or just feeling hot and wanting to take things off, maybe even feeling irritable as you're reacting. Okay, so again, um, 
Oops, oopsie. Unfortunately, I can't see my screen. So Lisa, this is a place I'm gonna have to pop out because something has come up on my screen that I have to escape to get my cursor back so I can cancel that. And then I need to move this if I can. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We can always put the real thing up later. Okay. The correct thing, you know, for you. Um, okay, so here we are. I just had to see what screen I was on. Okay, so the five essentials of a healthy immune system. Uh, as we mentioned, wind comes in uh, and we have to deal with it. Something new has come into my life and I need flexibility to deal with that change. Uh, we need resources to face the challenge. So by that, in Chinese medicine, by ample resources, it means that you have the substances that are needed to support the immune system to face the challenge. And specifically, that means you have ample energy that you've probably heard in Chinese medicine is referred to as qi. You have ample blood and you have ample fluids. These are important resources to have as your body is trying to manage and meet this pathogen, this change in our time. We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, how do you build up your chi and your blood and your fluids? Um, we also need uh, an ability to relate to a change. So as we know, one of the things about coronavirus uh, is that once it is established in the system and the system starts reacting to it, we have it progress into this COVID-19, which is the coronavirus disease for this iteration, 2019. Um, and as the body's reacting to it, sometimes the body will overreact to it. And that's, if you've, if you've heard or come across the term, the cytokine storm, it's that part of our immune system that's really trying to fight this uh, virus by amping up our inflammatory response. It's trying to stop the virus through through this cytokine storm, which is very reactive. So, and of course, that's what gets people into a lot of danger with their lives. That's what threatens the life the most, is that part of the disease. So we want to be able to relate more than react. And we want our immune system to have appropriate boundaries that when we encounter this change, we know what we're willing to deal with and what we aren't, and we're able to throw out what we don't want to deal with. So boundaries are important. And then once we encounter the pathogen and we have related to it, the ability to restore our health once again, that's the piece of being resilient. And then finally to learn from the experience. So you could think of that as having antibodies to the virus that your body now has a memory of what happened. It knows how to deal with the virus and it's gonna take that memory forward. So the next time you're exposed to the virus, you have your immune system has what it needs to relate to it. Um, and these are all metaphorical. So there are a lot of ways that we can work with all of these five concepts it, that, that don't have to do with um, antibodies building up. We don't, we don't have to know chemistry or biochemistry, physiology. Okay, so coming to the first point of the, the um, five essentials of strengthening the immune system, we want to be able to have, be flexible to deal with the change that is coming into our lives. And boy, has this virus really brought a lot of change <laughs> into our lives. So one thing that I recommend to my patients is that you don't stop counseling. You keep going to your counselor or your acupuncturist or your health coach or your best friend or your spouse or your, your canary that you like to talk to, that you stay in contact with people 
and you continue uh, sharing and trying to process your experience. That's all part of being flexible with change. You're not resisting it. You're trying to, to meet it and deal with it. Um, another little point is to build new skills. A lot of us have had to learn how to deal with online teaching or online sessions or online learning. Huge learning curves that we're having to face. Now we have to shift our behaviors to be flexible like this bamboo in this picture with, with the wind that's blowing through. Um, of course, uh, taking the metaphor of flexibility, what a great thing to do. If you have time on your hands, grab a YouTube video and learn some Qigong or some Tai Chi, do some yoga, martial arts. Uh, all these things are gonna help promote your flexibility that physically. You can also do things like mindfulness meditation, um, concentration practices, mindful awareness practices, Again, to help the, phys the, the flexibility of your mind is also important. Um, just, again, in the realm of mindfulness, being able to investigate our thoughts. Sometimes we really believe what we think. This is an opportunity to start playing with thoughts and attitudes and beliefs and going, hmm, is, is that really true? Maybe you can have some flexibility in your thoughts and attitudes. Um, something that's really beautiful that my colleagues in Italy, uh, two of my colleagues in Italy wrote an amazing report. It's in Italian. I'm sure it can be translated. Um, but it was so gorgeous. And this is one of the things they had to say in there. Um, if we cannot be responsive in confronting and adapting to change, we might experience illness. Uh, they were specifically saying that when wind and cold come into the body and we become rigid, we cling to life as the way it was. We hold on to our old habits and we're unable to adapt to it. So again, you want to be able to notice what you're, if you're holding on to anything that you're kind of stuck in it. That's a metaphor for cold. The wind, the change has come, and now you're, you're holding on for deal. I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to let that go. It's, it's time to adapt. Got to move, got to move with what's happening. Um, so letting go of things that maybe keep you stuck. If there are things that you wanted to do, but you stopped doing them for whatever reason, and you still have that desire, maybe it's time to jump into that. Um, the, I have a little note here, as you'll see, reduce damp foods in your diet. When I studied herbal medicine, it was in Sichuan province in China, which tends to be very hot and damp. And dampness is, um, my translator in China, it, when I was asking him, what, what, what is it going to be like in the summer here in Chengdu? And he said, it's like somebody puts a hundred pound wet blanket on you and turns up the heat to 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And you have to walk around with this hot, wet thing on your body. That's what dampness is like. It keeps us stuck and it keeps us bleh. Um, and damp, think about the thing that comes out of your nose when you're sick, phlegm. That's dampness. That's Phlegm is, again, it's your body's way of slowing something down. It's trying to slow that pathogen down. It's trying to encase it so you can blow it out or cough it out or get rid of it some other way from your body. Um, so this concept of damp is also one, is another element that we want to minimize right now is this stuckness. And so eating aromatic spices like cumin and coriander and cardamom, those are, those are ways to kind of loosen up and clear the dampness out. And of course, if you're following COVID-19, even though the cough is dry, people are 
the mucus plugs in the lungs, that's what's compromising their life is the amount of phlegm that is accumulating in these people. So uh, releasing dampness and then using herbal adaptogens, which Joe's gonna talk some more about and herbal tonics, they also help us. That'll be um, when we talk about amping up our resources, why the tonic herbs are so important. And again, connecting with others. Just like I'm speaking to you today because we have some people who really know technology well and are very well experienced in radio, so they're able to help us. Um, we've got Pat holding down the farm and we've got Joe who has all bringing this wealth of knowledge about herbs. So connecting with others helps us be flexible. Anybody want to chime in about any of that? <laughs> that was a lot. I've actually, I've actually come up with several things that comments that, um, and things that um, you that I've I've experienced recently proving um, what you're saying. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to comment on is um, when you were talking about as you're getting sick, and a key thing that I have known as I've been learning with you as you treat me I learn you, know, you teach me how to pay more attention you know and that is the critical piece and I've I've gotten the flu three times over the course of probably the eight years that I've been seeing you and each time I got it I didn't pay attention to the the earliest signs mm -hmm. and if I had paid attention to the earliest signs and they were always a little different but they all were so related to what you talk about as wind, though in one time that was actually just what I experienced as super dryness in my house and my not going to bed when I should have because I had things to get done. And if I had paid attention, probably even just like taking a moment to do what it took to change that, what was wrong with my environment and just have a cup of hot tea that maybe had some gentle adaptogens in it, I bet you I would not have gotten nearly as sick. And I could have had the presence of mind to start taking the tools that I use to you know, reduce the ability of that virus to multiply. So that, that to me seems like a key point that fits in with that early response kind of thing. Um, and then I'm reflecting on what you and Joe did to help Diane recover so quickly from whatever she had. We can't know what it was, but it was flu-like symptoms. She woke up after the day of following your protocol, which was more than one thing as, as it progressed, but she woke up in the morning to have a miso soup to which she went outside and grabbed the young shooting greens. Mm -hmm. And Margo, I know you completely inspired me over the last few years talking about the cycle of cleansing being like around the time when we have so little to eat. It was such a natural cycle. And then what you then start to eat is those young shooting greens. And so she did that. And then the next thing she did was she gone, you know? And after that, she felt completely better. You know, so I just, I think that just so proves what you're saying, you know. Um, and then the last thought I had was when you were talking about the damp and the heat and being there and feeling like a blanket. I generally, I lived in New Orleans, I generally take the heat really well. I tell, I tell Diane I have a really good thermostat, I can handle it all different ways. But if I have been stressed, like when I had the bakery and did not get enough sleep and was doing this super bake, and then going to work at the Highland Lake Inn after having slept maybe three hours over the course of about 40 hours, right? When I got to work, it was usually like in the late morning, early afternoon, I could not bear the heat. I just couldn't bear it. I would stand there and think, this gets me to understand how evil slavery was, to have to have to be in this heat, you know? And normally that isn't, every other day I was fine, but because I was stressed and I wasn't taking care of myself, I couldn't take that heat. So I think that just ties into what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. You, we lose our resilience to deal with our environment when we're, when we're stressed, when we don't have enough resources, which rest will replenish for us. We'll, we'll get to that in the next slide. Um, yes, perfect point. The, the, this is all about how we're relating to our lives, how we're relating to our environment and how flexible and resourceful we feel and how skillful we feel to deal with the changes that come, how flexible we can be, how, how much we can adapt. Um, and Patrick, you also brought up a really good 
point, which I would like to respond to. If you are working with a practitioner, which I strongly advise because the symptoms can be, the symptoms and signs can be confusing, they can be mixed. It's just helpful to have someone with expertise on how to read your symptoms and signs to recommend the appropriate um, response to it. Not that we're gonna get it right every time because it is complicated and things change very quickly. Uh, but one of the beauties of, um, that I really appreciate about my patients, many of my patients, is that they're super proactive as, as Patrick was speaking about, um, as Diane was. Very aware of, wow, you know what? In just like from one minute to the next, I just feel a little bit of thickness in the back of my throat and my energy just tanked. You know, I have about 50% of the energy I had a minute ago. If at that point you can, if you have been able to cultivate your own self-awareness through movement practices, through mindfulness practices, over your lifetime, if you've been able to cultivate that ability to notice how you feel and when it changes, the sooner you get to, uh, to help, the, the better your overall prognosis is going to be. Rather than waiting for the full-blown sore throat, though that sometimes that happens like that, um, rather than waiting to see yeah, I don't feel so good, but I'm just going to push ahead because I'm, I got a lot of stuff to do right now. And then you're feeling achy and then you're feeling super tired and then the phlegm comes. The longer you wait, the more difficult it is to effectively treat that um, with small measures. <laughs> and that's what you want. You want to treat it with small measures if you can. Anybody else have anything um, before I move on, about flexibility, Oops, being like the bamboo. Great time to eat bamboo. Joe, are the bamboo shoots coming up yet? I haven't gone out to see. Yes, they are. Super. So again, metaphorically speaking, eat a plant that it has great flexibility in the wind. Good medicine. Okay, so the next the next essential of supporting your healthy immune system is um, amping up your resources internally and your vital substances. So again, vital substances in Chinese medicine are your energy, your blood, and your fluids. Um, you can improve your blood through eating food that looks like blood. Here's a big pot of beets and maybe Swiss chard stems. Um, so if it looks like blood, it probably tonifies the blood. Like elderberry syrup looks like blood and beets and red meat and blueberries and raspberries and blackberries, uh, red aduki beans. Those are all good foods to nourish the blood and you need, you need blood because it is one of the most essential vital substances to confront the wind, to meet the wind. So again, in Chinese medicine, the metaphor is if you have a pipe or a tunnel, if you've ever been in a tunnel, um, the wind blows through the tunnel. The air, it's like it gets funneled in and shoots through there. So if you fill that tunnel with the substance, the wind can't move through so well. And blood is the substance that fills our metaphorical tunnels. <laughs> so nourishing the blood is very important. And some formulas, some Chinese medicine formulas that are meant to deal with wind have blood tonics in them. Um, and Maybe Joe will touch on some of those blood tonic herbs as he's talking about the formulas he's been researching. Um, so again, nourishing the chi. If you all have heard of astragalus, that's one of the herbs and one of the main formulas that Joe's going to be, um, I think, discussing. Astragalus is an 
is a tonic for the chi. It's a tonic for our energy. So that's an important herb. Another herb that Joe might mention is kudzu. Um, and kudzu nourishes fluids. Kudzu also deals with wind. So uh, again, you, through herbal medicine, through diet, nourishing fluids through diet is pretty easy. You eat foods that are, have fluid or you make soups where you're ingesting fluid or you're drinking hydrating fluids like lemon water or lemon honey tea um, that you're keeping your fluids up. And as uh, Patrick mentioned, rest, you got to have rest. Rest helps us uh, recharge our resources. So resting is very important for that resilience to change. And finally, again, connecting with community. Immune system is about relating. Um, and our community, if we don't have the resources ourselves, someone in our community does. So if you don't have a garden and you're running out of food, someone in your community will have some way of helping you. So reach out and connect to people. That's your strength for your immune system. Um, Anything about that, you guys, that you want to chime in on? I think I, I'd like to say one thing um, that I, I think especially younger people don't understand the importance of the circadian rhythm aligning with the light and dark. And so many of the screen generations of the last few decades have never grown up without the internet and are, their whole life is about a screen and at night they're on their phone till they're asleep and then they're not getting good rest and they're up till past two in the morning when they're missing their gold standard sleep. And I just feel like it's an issue that um, is really not fully grasped the, the profundity, like the gravity of needing to sleep at night and get up in the day. <laughs> I know so many young people and they have not nearly the amount of energy young people should have because they've got it flipped and they're screen addicts. So to me, that's a real part of rest is to align with the circadian rhythm of the sun and the day and the night. And to really, that's a cornerstone of immunity right there mm -hmm. is to have the circadian rhythm and the rest, you know, as much as you can. I think. Awesome. Marco, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead and respond to Lisa. Please, please forgive me. You sure? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yes, beautiful point. While you were talking about young people, Lisa, I'm one of those people who's staying up till two in the morning. Are you doing it, you little <laughs> whippersnapper? <laughs> and, I, and I'm not a young whippersnapper anymore. I was going to say um, older people do it too. We all do it with screens, right? And then, and, then, and then people say, but I'm just not sleepy. Well, because you're looking at a light and your melatonin can't work. Yeah. So I go round yeah. and round with, with I, I deal with the young set. So I'm, that's what I'm talking about. I know, I know you're naughty. You're doing it too, right? You kinda... <laughs> yep. I'm being, a, I'm being obsessive about learning as much as I can. So I'm staying up late. And then, right. and then I have to stop and give myself an hour to read poetry or do some breathing or stretch out on the floor. Um, the other thing about rest that's interesting because um, many of my patients are reporting this now too, even the ones who are in their 20s and 30s, because of the stress and anxiety, they're not able to sleep. And so they're losing, they're losing good sleep time. And again, um, from the perspective of Chinese medicine, sometimes our insomnia actually has to do with one of these vital substances that we don't have enough of. And um, so the herbal formulas to help with insomnia often have blood tonics in them or yin tonics in them. Um, sometimes even a chi tonic will be in there for sleep. Uh, there was something else I was gonna say about that, but I, it flew out my brain. Um, so yeah, the, re the importance of the vital resource. And then, yes, in terms of the anxiety, the importance of connecting with your community so you don't feel alone, you don't feel isolated, that you feel like you have people you can call on for resources, even if that resource is just moral support, that's important to help us with sleep. So Patrick, did you have anything? 
Well, actually, what you just said made me think of something else. But first off, just kind of a simple point. I don't know if you can see those. Those are astragalus. Oh, yes. And I don't know if that's something to do, but I just learned a long time ago, just kind of like, you know, folk knowledge from other people, to put a couple of those in every pot of rice that I cook. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Is that, are we doing good if we do that? Are we needing more guidance or? No. Okay, good. If you're cooking it, you're doing it right. Okay, cool. And yes, that's right. You, you will find that in traditional um, folk foods to add these simple herbs just into your regular food because uh, they're all food grade. They're, they're things that you can cook with. I mean, Astragalus with chicken soup is that's also really good. So sometimes they'll throw in blood tonics into soups and stews, sometimes chi tonics, sometimes things to moderate dampness. Um, yeah, that's all good stuff. Joe, did you have anything you wanted to add to the vital substances conversation? No, okay. <laughs> I had one other thing about rest and and just to notice if you're waking up at a certain time in the night, of course, the Chinese calendar, you know, can be an insight to areas where you might be needing more of that vital substance to, to tonify yourself. If you're waking up every night at three or four, you know, lungs or whatever, how it goes through the clock, just to remember that. Yeah, yeah, good point, Lisa, that the every two hours, our energy shifts into another organ system. So the Chinese have that mapped out on the clock. If you wake up between one and three, it's related to the liver. And if you wake up between three and five, it's related to the lungs. So um, yes, you can note the time. And again, if you're working with a practitioner, if you just want to look it up online, you might get a little more information. The liver, its main resource is blood. The lungs, main resource is qi. So you can work on tonifying those substances based on the time. Good point. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> okay, and the so, third. Go ahead. Well, I had one other comment on that. When you were talking about that need for community, I got a call from a friend saying that they had a very dear friend who was alone in a um, kind of upscale um, development and who had been in a room with one of the first people to get tested positive in our area and had all the symptoms and was terrified and was freaking out. And can I please go bring this person some, you know, some of the tinctures we made, the elderly tincture and anything we had. And I just, I just thought when I was going out the door, I'd, I'd forced a lot of bulbs and I'm not getting them to Diane as much as I want to because I'm not up there. And so I saw this pot full of daffodils and grape, amp, grape, um, grape hyacinths that were just starting to bloom and I brought them up and I, you know, I knocked on her door, I put those down with this little bag of some tea. She didn't have any contraindications for a tea that had licorice in it. So I had a tea with licorice, um, a oh. breathe easy formula from traditional medicinals. I really like that company. Um, mm -hmm. And I just put that at her door and then stepped back since I thought she probably had it at about 30 feet, but then talked to her from that distance and let her know that we were there for her, that she wasn't, she was afraid she'd get sucked into the hospital, they wouldn't be able to help her and she'd be alone. And she just was basically terrified and freaking out mm -hmm. and stressed. And I just got her that, no, there was a community that was gonna be there for her. She said she was so upset she was smoking more. And I said, please explain to her how much her lungs needed not to have that smoke. I think I convinced her, I said, you gotta smoke one puff, you know, at the most, you know, and if you don't, can't inhale, don't do it. And she started to calm down and I was in touch the next day with a, a better formula that we'd made up for her. And she was already feeling better within two days. She was like, you saved my life, I'm on the way out. And I'm like, don't re relax, keep doing all that stuff. But from what I can tell, she's fine and she probably did have it. And I think probably the worst thing for her would have been the stress more than anything else. And that, yeah. that sense that there was a community there for her and there were people that were gonna use everything they had to help her. And then she said, you don't know how much those flowers meant, you know? just that connection to nature, you know? Um, yeah. And so I think that that part about community is critical and I think we can all do it intuitively. And as I hear you talking about it, I agree completely the importance of wisdom and guidance. I should have said, here, call this acupuncture. <laughs> but I was just <laughs> acting from, you know, in the middle of a day with lots of other things to do. You know, when I went to the store and got her the closest I think I'd get to miso and brought her some greens from the garden and said, make the, you know, she said she wasn't eating. And I said, you got to eat some, you don't have to eat a lot, but you need some. And this is the kind of stuff to eat, you know, and 
and just that kind of support, I think, is critical to getting people through yeah. here. We can all do that for each other. And yes, uh, next time I'll say, and call this person, you know, because they're so <laughs> much smarter than me, you know, and we probably have a bunch of the herbs that they're going to recommend. So, mm. Well, you did, if, if the immune system is about relationship, you did the most medicinal thing possible by reaching out and creating that relationship with her. Um, I think that's paramount. And I think that's what's so interesting about this, um, this virus and this time and the disease that is manifesting through it. It is calling us to connect, even though we have to do this physical distancing business. And I'm sorry they're calling it social distancing because that's the last thing we need is social distance. We need physical distance. Um, but we need to connect with each other. We've got to help empower each other. We've got to be each other. We can't all contain all the medicine. We've got, we, everybody has a different skill to share. So this is calling us to relate to each other, which I think is really cool. And that's the immune system. That's the collective immune system for our herd immunity is to get together. So Margo, that, that makes me think of something I just heard that was quite disturbing to me. I have a young friend who was talking to other young friends who were not doing social distancing. They said it wasn't worth the damage it would do to their community and to their social relationships. And I think that you, you made the point they need to hear right now. They can still have that community and those social relationships. They just need to do the physical distancing. They can be creative. They're young, yes. they're energetic. There's lots of ways for them to stay intimately in touch with each other and maintain yes. that physical distance. Yes, I think, I think that it's no, it's no mystery that we have the internet in this time of coronavirus. We're, 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 we're able to connect with each other and see the changes, the positive changes that are happening globally um, with the environment. Um, I think there's a reason for that. We had, we had this weekend, all of my children, um, most of them are adults and they live on their own and they live here in Silo. Um, and they have been self quarantining for a minimum of two weeks. Uh, we've been in quarantine for over a month because my Italian family was telling me, don't mess around with this, shut your practice and stay home. Uh, so we've been in quarantine for over a month. Our kids have been for two weeks. Um, we had a bonfire at our house and we had sticks that were six feet, over six feet long. <laughs> so, you know, you had your stick, you could keep everybody away from you. And we enjoyed each other so much. We had a big bonfire. We, we, um, we wore masks and my husband and I, because we've been in the quarantine longest, we set out food on plates that had just come out of the dishwasher, handled with gloves. Um, we set food out on the picnic table and everybody went one at a time to get their plate. And we were all able to really enjoy each other. Um, staying six feet apart in a very large field. <laughs> I just want to do a quick time check, Marco. It's 3.17 oh, yes. and you want it okay. to end by four and the meeting is scheduled to end at four and I yes. don't want to make you late um, and Joe hasn't gone yet. So I just want to yes. make sure we can get through your presentation because I just realized what time it is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we've just got, I think, three more slides. Okay, great. Um, just want to make the, sure the, the, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so the third, the third essential about a strong immune system is, like I said, to set boundaries. What, what are you willing to deal with and what aren't you willing to deal with? Physical boundaries, like wearing a scarf or a mask. Um, gl gloves are a boundary. Um, garnering your relational capability. Again, we've just been speaking about that. Stay connected to other people. Um, another concept in Chinese medicine is to release the exterior so that you can throw the wind off your body, out of your body, that you can disperse cold and you can clear heat. And these are treatment principles and strategies that you'll see in the herbal medicine and in acupuncture. 
that your practitioner will use or as if you're researching herbs in a particular formula and they're Chinese herbs, you're going to see their strategy. Uh, astragalus nourishes the chi. That's a strategy. Um, what do we have? We have mahuang, we have uh, ephedra, re releases the exterior, disperses wind and cold. So these are strategies that the herbs have. Um, and then a final little piece is to relax muscles and tendons. So how you can do this is on this slide through gua sha, which is the dermal scraping. I'm in my son's room. Um, he's got a little incense bowl here. I prefer to use something of natural material for gua sha, but this is plastic. Um, I'm sorry if I'm messing up my mic. Yeah, just get it back comfy. How you, yeah, you're there. There you go. There you go. Uh, so just something with a smooth, smooth edge, smooth rim. It could be an ashtray. It could even be your fingernail. I'm actually going to use my fingernail because I don't want to scrape myself with plastic. But it basically, you're just doing quick, quick little strokes to scratch the skin. You can do it with a brush. You can do it with a coin. Uh, you can do it with an ashtray. You can do it with a seashell. Oh, here, I've got some old, old Italian coins here on the windowsill. Anyway, that's gua sha. You can look up on YouTube how to do that. Um, as I mentioned, some herbs have exterior releasing properties. This one that I put up here is um, fung fung. Uh, now I can't remember the uh, Latin name for it. <laughs> Joe, do you know the Latin name for fung fung? Oh, it's got a bunch of them. So Pashnikova is the main one that people are using. You got it. Um, movement practices can help muscles and tendons. I've got a picture of one of my favorite online teachers, Mimi Quo Deemer. Uh, she'll be on the resource page at the end. And my internet connection is unstable. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And then uh, mindfulness or meditation practices to help you reconnect to yourself. That's part of the boundary, creating boundaries. I know myself, I know what I'm able and willing to take on and what I'm really just not able to and willing to take on right now because it's going to weaken me. Uh, and because we have such a steep learning curve right now, we might want to take on a lot and that might not be such a good idea. You might want to set a boundary of how much you're saying yes to things. Any comments or questions on no. that? Good. Okay. So coming into the home stretch here on the essentials of our immune system, restoring homeostasis. So how, when I've had a bump, when I've hit a bump in the road and I didn't feel so good and I treated myself, I released the exterior, I cleared the wind or the heat, how do I come back to myself now after that and find some balance? Again, tonic and adaptogenic herbs, really super important here to return back to a state of, of balance. Movement can be really useful, again, because you're helping to relax your body and your mind. Um, Self-centering and self-regulating practices that comes back to mindfulness. And here again, we have connecting to others. You got you to gotta, you gotta plug in here. And then the last point is to assimilate the lessons. So this is the metaphor of the antibodies. Your body now has an experience of this pathogen. It knows how to deal with it, and it's going to protect you the next time that you have to relate to it. So the ways that you can help your immune system is through reflection. Okay. As Patrick had mentioned earlier, um, when he was in New Orleans and it was super hot, he could negotiate the heat. But when he was stressed, he couldn't negotiate it so well. So there he was reflecting 
wow, when I get tired, I can't deal with the heat so well. So maybe that's going to help me make sure I get enough rest. That's reflecting, meditating, contemplating, journaling. This, this is what happened to me. What happened a few days before? Oh, I had a big fight with my husband. Oh, maybe that had something to do with me feeling a little more vulnerable and getting sick. Well, maybe I want to look at that and work with that. And again, herbal adaptogens are very important here. And sharing your experience with other people. Because sometimes as we're talking to friends, we might get a new insight into our situation that's going to help us the next time we encounter that challenge. Um, and I think that's my last slide before resources. Do you guys want to chime in on any of this? All good. All good. Yep. Yeah, I'm. I guess I'm counting on Joe to go over the adapt the adaptogens. I think they're probably pretty critical. Um, yes. And yes. There's so many of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they play an important role in our ability to adapt to the initial onset of the change, to the wind, to the exposure to the pathogen, and then they're also really critical as we're trying to. Um, establish some understanding moving forward uh, from our experience, so. And I guess, yeah, I kind of do wonder a little bit um, if, if either of you think that there are more specific adaptogens to this virus or if just all the general adaptogens are quite efficacious unto themselves and you don't have to worry so much about specificity. Uh, I, have, I have a response to that. I'm sure Joe does too, so. Uh, should I, should go I just go or yeah? yeah go ahead um, so again just oh man my inbox has been pretty nuts with my patients sending me all kinds of research and my colleagues and it's been pretty nutty my acupuncture association there's a lot of information out there it seems like from what I've read which has not been everything that has been sent to me it looks like astragalus is really coming in at number one. And then um, American ginseng, because it nourishes the fluids and it's, um, it helps support aspects of our physiology that relates to our immune system. Those are two big ones. Um, and uh, I've also seen medicinal mushrooms and green tea. Um, so I'd love to hear more from Joe about what, what you've been learning, Joe, about those adaptogens. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go with Joe's presentation now? Yes, I'm gonna stop sharing and... All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Margo. I'm going to go over to Joe and feature his screen here, spotlight his video. And Joe is going to be talking to us about antiviral herbs, Chinese and Western uh, also, and good to know and grow what to do with these adaptogens and, and all of his insight. Thank you, Joe, for being here today. Okay, um, so... I guess I'll start off talking a little bit about adaptogens since that subject just came up. So here's a pretty good book. Well, it looks uh, backwards. Maybe you have to read it in a mirror. Well, we'll but flip it. We'll flip it. I on can the see it. adaptogens. Uh, this is a good book by David Winston. There are a couple different books out on the subject of adaptogens. And I've got, uh, in a minute here, I'll give you a reference to something on my website that has a link to a very good little paper on adaptogens and how they work. Uh, because we really don't exactly understand what the immune system is. We're still learning. There's many, many different components to it. The whole body, different parts of the body uh, respond to stress. Adaptogens are defined as herbs that help the body adapt to stress. And they're generally speaking non-specific. That means they don't just target a particular receptor of a particular cell in your body, which is what the pharmaceutical industry is all about wanting to do. But these just have a general overall action on the body and they tend to normalize body function. So they don't make your blood pressure go up, they don't make it go down, they make it be normal. So you can't really overdose on normal, generally speaking. Uh, <laughs> so they're very safe. 
<laughs> These are considered the superior class of herbs in Chinese medicine, which means that they're for promoting health and the inferior class are for curing illness. The superior class are for promoting health and they're generally considered very safe and you can take a lot of them, but they are relatively slow acting. So you're not going to always get instant results with time, with the adaptogens. You ought to be taking them over a period of time. Uh, so David Winston's book here lists, there aren't uh, like a super large number of these adaptogens. The Chinese have been involved with developing and discovering adaptogens for several thousand years, as have the uh, Indians, the Ayurvedic medical system. Western herbalism uh, is completely lacking in this category. In China, they're called tonic herbs. In Ayurveda, they're called rasayanas, which is usually translated as rejuvenative. And we don't have that in Western herbalism. We got the herbs, but we don't have the concept. So really this whole concept just came into Western medicine when this word adaptogen was invented, which is only about 50 years ago, and it was invented basically by the Russians who were doing a whole lot of research into how they could increase uh, the physical performance of people in high stress activities like uh, astronauts and, you know, uh, workers in high stress occupations and particularly Olympic athletes. They really wanted to win more gold at the Olympics. Uh, and so they put a lot of research into these adaptogens and they brought a lot of them out of Chinese medicine into the West, like Siberian ginseng it was their big one that they researched and Shizandra was another one which you might have heard of. One by one, all these important uh, Chinese herbs are coming to America. Astragalus came a few years ago. Everybody's heard of astragalus by now. Goji berries, yeah, that's a few. Everybody knows goji berries by now, famous blood tonic. Uh, Shizandra's a new one, but bit by bit, they're all coming over. A couple more that I think would be particularly good in this instance are uh, probably cordyceps, which is a weird little mushroom that grows out of an insect, uh, like a little tiny mushroom that will grow out of a caterpillar, for example. And that became very famous, and the price of it like went up about a thousand times overnight when the Chinese women's volleyball team won the gold medal and attributed their success to the use of cordyceps. So there's an adaptogen that goes particularly to the lungs, which is what we're talking about because this COVID attacks primarily the lungs. That's where it gets into your body and then it all kinds of havoc, but it starts off by getting into your lungs and then reproducing because viruses cannot reproduce on their own. They can only reproduce inside the cells of a host. So they got to get in there to multiply, right? And where they get in is in your lungs. Uh, another one that I think would be quite good, astragalus was mentioned, that also goes to the lungs. A lot of these adaptogens do in Chinese medicine. Uh, Siberian ginseng, one of, uh, one of Stephen Buehner's big favorites that I'll mention in a minute is uh, rhodiola, a relatively new addition to the Chinese pharmacy. Uh, grows very far north, Russia, Scandinavia, Iceland, Alaska, uh, but this is a fairly new, uh, quite important, quite potent uh, adaptogen that we might look into. And there's the different aurelias. Rishi mushroom is a really good one, and we can actually be collecting Rishi mushroom around here anyway in another month or so, usually the beginning of June. It's one of the mushrooms that grows off of trees, and it will also grow off of hemlocks, which are all dying around here, so a certain percentage of them get Rishi. It's like a flat kind of shelf mushroom called a varnish shelf. They're very shiny on top. If you look at some pictures online, you'll it's not that hard to ID it. Uh, but you want to collect them fairly fresh, and, and that would be in June. And then we can make a supply. You can either tincture it, and there's lots of instructions online about how to tincture mushrooms. It's a somewhat complicated business, a little more complicated than tincturing most herbs. Usually a two-stage process. Uh, so those are a couple of the uh, chief adaptogens I mentioned. Ashwagandha and holy basil from Ayurvedic medicine are both really good, and they're both quite easy to grow from seed, and you can get a harvest within one year. 
Uh, even though ashwagandha is a perennial that generally harvested at the end of the first year, it's the root that's used. With holy basil, it's the whole upper part of the herb. Very uh, important herb in Ayurvedic medicine. So those are a couple. My big part of my focus uh, in general and in this talk is about things that we can grow ourselves to help us out. I think uh, herbs are a really good way to cure ourselves because it's connecting back to nature. But even better is if we can grow those herbs. Right. Licorice is another one that's mentioned. We can grow that, but it takes a few years to get a harvest. But that also uh, goes to the lungs according to Chinese medicine. And then my big favorite is Jiaogalan, which I think is the best adaptogen of all, uh, just because it's so easy to grow and so easy to use. Uh, Gynostema pentaphyllum, it's the only other plant that has ginsenicides in it besides the actual ginsengs. And the ginsengs are very, very difficult to grow. And it's like seven or eight years to harvest and they get a little dinky root and it costs a thousand dollars a pound. Uh, this gynostema is like, if you don't watch, it'll take over your garden. So it's the other way around. You have to put more energy into making sure it doesn't take over than you do into trying to grow it. And you just harvest the above ground part and make tea out of it. So if you can get a hold of some plant material, which I have plenty of, you can actually get a harvest in one year. Uh, anybody living even on the 10th floor of an apartment building, if you got a little balcony with a planter box, you could grow yourself a year's supply of gynostema. Dry it, drink it every day. I drink it every single day uh, for breakfast in the morning, often mixed with holy basil or American ginseng leaf or like uh, different other adaptogenic herbs. So that's some stuff about adaptogens. Uh, and then I wanted to move on to like immune boosting uh, tonics that we're making. So I've got a little thing that, that should be up on my website. I don't really have a link, uh, but I think we put it up under the blog thing and it's called adaptogens and other immunity boosting herbs and antiviral formulas. And it's just a two page summary of the things that I'm making here. Uh, mostly to serve my own community. So don't write to me and ask you to mail me tinctures because I'm not going to do that. But I can mail you uh, bare root plants. So some of the plants that we'll talk about, I can mail them to you if you can't find any other source for them. So I'm using a couple of different things here. One is this book by Stephen Buhner called Herbal Antivirals, and it's really very good. Uh, He's written a lot about uh, dealing with Lyme's disease with herbs, and he's got two books out, Herbal Antivirals and Herbal Antibiotics, responding to the situation that we're in where these emerging diseases have developed immunity to pretty much everything the pharmaceutical industry has developed to throw at them. Of course, as most people know, antibiotics are almost useless at this point because we saturated the environment with them, that was all because of the beef industry, because if they give tons of antibiotics to the cows, they get a slightly better feed to meat ratio. And so they make a little bit more money. And so now antibiotics don't work. So thanks folks. Uh, and you know, we've saturated the environment in other ways with antibiotics. So there's almost no antibiotics left. So, and then the viruses are like, uh, absolute wizards at avoiding pharmaceutical medicine. They're just mutating constantly and sending out slight variants. So it's this whole issue, as Buner talks about and other people have talked about for a long time, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical silver bullet versus the herbal shotgun. So these diseases are very, very able to avoid the pharmaceutical silver bullet. They just move over a little bit. Whereas an herb is a drug cocktail. You know, they finally started to treat AIDS with drug cocktails, which is something they learned from herbal medicine. Not that they gave it any credit or anything, but boom, you know, the herb is like hundreds of compounds. The disease can't just move over and redesign itself. The viruses actually can incorporate fragments of the medicine into their own DNA. Reading about that, this is really such a fascinating book to know what's going on with viruses and what their abilities are and how throughout the whole evolution of life on Earth, viruses have been taking little bits of DNA from over here 
and infecting over here and just spreading DNA. So there's all this cross cultural connections in evolution, which nobody understood 50 years ago. It's a whole new, our whole grasp of how life has developed on earth has changed totally uh, from our realization of how these are the original GMO guys, gene splicers, like this CRISPR technology where they can take a little piece of DNA, you know, and put it in here somewhere else. That's what they've been doing for a million years, the viruses. So we're up against like astounding uh, opposition here. Uh, not that we want to get rid of all the viruses on earth. As I said, they're, they're really essential to all of human evolution. But as far as our situation at the moment, confronted with this COVID virus, uh, we're in trouble, <laughs> I would say. And it's just going to keep, I mean, it might never go away. You know, it might just keep evolving little bits and little bits. There's already apparently in China people who had it and developed immunity, and now they're catching it again because it's changed a little bit and it can reinfect them. This is terrifying, actually. But the plants are a big help. So uh, these are some things. So then the other thing I'm doing is going online and finding the formulas that they're using in China. And these are quite readily available. Well, unfortunately, there's like a lot of them. <laughs> it's a lot to work with. Uh, I just saw this morning a really good list from the American Herbalist Guild. They've got a reference page. And if you go on there, it's like doom, 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 doom. But one of the sections is TCM. And there are many, many reports of exactly what uh, herb formulas are using in China. There's also a terrific YouTube video by a man named John Chen. And I think you can probably just look him up, John Chen coronavirus or whatever on YouTube. It goes for about an hour and a half and he discusses uh, the basis of their understanding, Chinese understanding of the disease and then the three, uh, the formulas for the different stages. So the Chinese have formulas for each different stage starting with prevention before you even get it. And then when you're first starting to catch it, and then as it moves in, and this has always been the way with Chinese medicine, as it moves farther in, you've got different medicine to deal with it. Uh, so they got four or five different formulas. Basically, it's gonna give you pneumonia. Uh, so you got pneumonia prevention formula. So we're making those. Uh, one of the basic things we're making, so those are the two things I'm working with is the Herbal Antivirals book, which does reference a lot of Chinese herbs, but he also references a lot of Western herbs. He's not, he's very uh, eclectic, global. He's taking herbs from all over the place. Uh, whereas the Chinese, and of course the Chinese have a 2000 year history of dealing with pandemics. And this is just another pandemic. Uh, so they're pretty well set up for it, you know, but each one is new and different. But it's quite impressive how Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong and Singapore have coped with uh, coronavirus versus Italy and Spain and the United States, which are really uh, failing very badly. Um, and it's because they have, you know, this thousands of years of experience with pandemics and treating them with herbs that they're coming out so well, I think. So there are a lot of these Chinese herbs. You can look up these formulas. You can listen to John Chen's video. It's going to be a little hard to follow if you're not uh, familiar with the lingo, the way Chinese talk about physiology in the body. But I think by and large, people will be able to follow it. Um, there's also on the American Herbalist Guild, quite a nice little lecture by Thomas Guerron, who is an expert in uh, using Western herbs according to Chinese medicine. Thomas Guerron actually visited my garden last year. He lives in China, and we taught a couple of workshops together on these subjects. And so he has put up a video, and you can access it once again from the American Herbalist Guild website talking about a couple of key formulas that they're using in China. And then he tries to work through like which Western herbs could you use to substitute for the Chinese herbs, which is a topic of great interest to me. And I've taught workshops on that before. Uh, and so I'll touch on that here in a minute. Okay, but those are some of the things we're working with. Um, so what we've made up for my community here. And I would say, if you go online to uh, my website, mountaingardensherbs.com, and you look under my blog, I think that this 
little short two-page essay is there that talks about the things that we're making that might be useful in this situation. So one of them, probably the formula that Chinese people are most looking for for immune boosting is called Jade Screen. Uh, and it's just three different herbs. Uh, unfortunately, two of them are not very easy for us to grow. Astragalus is the main one that we can actually grow. Uh, and then there's a Tractalus, another Chi tonic, and Fang Feng, which is the commander of the wind. Margaret has talked to us about wind. Unfortunately, I've not had great success growing either of those. I got a couple of plants in my garden, but I just can't figure out what they really want to thrive. You know? But they can be purchased uh, online, so we're buying a lot of herbs. A lot of the key ones are getting sold out. Unfortunately, but a lot of things are still available. The jade screen, I just looked up online for Patrick the other day. There's plenty of jade screen available online in the form of pills and in some cases uh, as tinctures. And there are some variations in the formulas. They're not always just those three herbs. Some of them are different. Most of the main brand names I saw that popped up when I Googled jade screen are quite respectable uh, brand names. I would tend to avoid the stuff coming from China uh, in favor of some of the stuff ma being manufactured in the USA. Uh, but we've been manufacturing that, cranking it out. We just make a strong decoction and then preserve it with alcohol. So it doesn't take a whole month as it does often with a tincture. The rationale being that uh, a lot of these polysaccharides such as are in astragalus, these other immunity herbs are more soluble in water. You don't just want to pitch them into alcohol and wait a month. You do better to cook them in water. It's the same situation with like reishi mushroom. For example, you're better to just give it a long, slow decoction and then preserve that with some alcohol. Uh, Jade Screen, we make one called Immunity 3. I think that's uh, Stragalus, Shiz uh, Shizandra, and uh, reishi mushroom. Uh, Buner has his own favorite immunity three, which is cordyceps, rhodiola, and astragalus. A lot of overlaps here. We're making one called astragalus immunity tonic. That's a seven forest formula from uh, Institute for Traditional Medicine Online, Sabuti Dharmananda. A really excellent website. It's got a lot of really good website uh, write-ups. For example, uh, so. Stephen Buhner wrote a little report uh, which is very easily available online. Uh, I thought I had it right here. If you look for uh, Stephen Buhner coronavirus, Buhner, B-U-H-N-E-R, it will pop up. So he's got this whole book on herbal antivirals, but he's also got this like 20 page essay on specifically on the coronavirus. Herbal treatment for coronavirus infections. So what Buner is picking as his uh, formula of choice, natural protocols for SARS group vital infection, da, 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 da. Uh, suggested protocol of general protective Shuang Huang Lian formula. So the Shuang Huang Lian formula is three herbs. It's uh, Honeysuckle flowers, forsythia fruit, and uh, Huang Lian. Pretty sure it's Huang Lian. Yeah, Coptis, one of the berberine containing herbs. So the honeysuckle flowers are very, very important. One of them, maybe the foremost uh, antiviral in Chinese medicine. And that is just the flower buds of the weedy honeysuckle that is more or less everywhere. Lanicera japonica, an invasive exotic. And Buner has a whole interesting theory about invasive exotics for invasive diseases, uh, which of course would drive any scientist up the wall. Uh, how, can you make, you know, how can you make that connection? <laughs> that invasive exotics are due for good for invasive diseases. There's just like no grounds in scientific Western knowledge to make that kind of a connection any more than we can make a connection between things that are red and the blood. That's just nonsense to any scientist. Yet, all over the world, people believe in the doctrine of signatures. 
So, so yeah, to get back to it, it's the, little, it's the flower buds. So they're super tedious to collect. How they can sell them for as cheap as they do, I don't know, but the price is going up because I just paid $60 a pound. It used to be $5 a pound for years and years. The forsythia, unfortunately, it's not really the hybrid forsythia that's in everybody's front yard. And it's the fruit of the forsythia. And that hybrid, I mean, you may, if you see some little seed pods, you might try them. They might have some component of value. But I think being a hybrid, it probably is not making any seeds, unfortunately. Uh, Huang Lian, again, we can't really grow. We could conceivably substitute for that with something like golden seal another berberine containing yellow rooted plant. Joe, might... I have a question there. Yeah. What about um, our riparian and losing the name, yellow root? What about yellow root? Would that be a good yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. that'd be a good that's one. That's pretty available. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's even more available than golden seal. Yeah. 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 In a pinch, I would definitely go for either one of those. So uh, there's a very good write-up on Shuang Huang Lian on the ITM online website by Sabudi Dharmananda. He's also got a very nice web, uh, very nice write-up on uh, Jade Screen. It's really an excellent uh, website. What and what is the name of that website again? ITM Online Institute of Traditional Medicine Online. Uh, let's see. So, uh, so we made up several of these uh, formulas from China. One's called a pneumonia prevention formula. Uh, we've also got one from a different website, Cheng Number One Prevention. Uh, there's a kudzu formula, which is traditionally in Chinese medicine. Gagan Tang. Gagan is the name for uh, kudzu, poor area. And that particularly goes to lungs and helps moisten the lungs. So that was a particularly good immune boosting formula to use in this kind of situation. There's also one called Defense Energy. That's a very important uh, gegentang. No. Gui. Cinnamon twig. No, I'm blanking on it. Gui something. Uh, and that's a really good if you get like if you're chilled and you're feeling too cold, which is probably not going to happen this time of year, uh, and you feel like your body is stressed out and maybe you're going to catch something because you've caught this chill, because the cinnamon and ginger that are in it will really help warm you up. But these are all basic immune boosting, uh, you know, fighting off the initial stages of an infection formula. Standard ones in Chinese medicine. Yin Chow is another one. That's honeysuckle forsythia powder and a bunch of other herbs and the honeysuckle forsythia were the same ones I just mentioned in conjunction with this Shuang Huang Lian. That's a very famous combination, honeysuckle flowers and forsythia fruit. And if you got little kids and you got a bunch of wild honeysuckle, I was just going to mention, they'll be great at harvesting these uh, teeny little flower buds. So take your kids out into this big field of honeysuckle and you can spend the afternoon uh, harvesting little tiny flower buds, and they will be very useful to you. Uh, there are lots and lots of single herbs that are mentioned that we could utilize. So Buner has got a little section in here called uh, his top seven antiviral herbs. And they are Chinese skullcap, elder, ginger, hutinia, isatis, licorice, lamadium. So just to go over them, uh, Chinese skullcap is a very important herb in Chinese medicine, Huang Chin Scutellaria bicolensis. And it's become, uh, just in the last few years, it's become very well known to Western herbalists uh, because of its value in pretty much everything having to do with the blood. And it does have a red root. So, <laughs> so blood pressure, things do with regulating the heart, uh, circulation of blood. All that stuff Huang Jin is used for, but it's also turning out to be a major antiviral herb. So we can grow this. Unfortunately, I don't know if seed is even available online anymore, and it would take about three years to get it to harvest. I have had some in my garden. Unfortunately, I let my supply kind of run down, like here at the critical moment when I should be able to go out there and dig a whole bunch of it up. I just don't have all that much. Uh, and... It's mostly sold out online, unfortunately. 
Anyway, moving on to something a little more promising, elder. Uh, so elderberries are everywhere out there now. Uh, they're very easy to recognize when they're in flower, which is going to happen pretty soon. They get these great big white uh, heads of flowers and this kind of dissected leaves. You can look online and get some pictures. Uh, but Buner is calling for uh, using a tincture of the leaf and the bark. So most of the herb literature you're going to read is going to say that all the green parts of elder are poisonous. So Buner retorts and says, no, they're not poisonous at all. They are just emetic, meaning that they will make you vomit if you take too much, which is different from poison. And he says you can avoid the emetic aspect by decocting it. So if you cook the leaf first and then add the alcohol and tincture it or the bark, it will not make you throw up. But also you should be careful about your dose. If you take five dropper fulls and it makes you throw up, then next time take four. <laughs> you know, figure out what your dosage is on it. Uh, but he's got a lot of information in there and on the uh, little free thing that I said he has online about the coronavirus, you can read up on the ways that he is using elder. And that's a very, very available uh, plant for us here in the Southern Appalachians or maybe wherever you are. The red berried ones, Ambucus racemosus, had a reputation of being even more poisonous. He says, no, it's not poisonous either. That's more on the West Coast, I think. Ours is Sambucus canadensis. In Europe, they have Sambucus nigra, but they're almost the same. You can think of them interchangeably. Uh, his number three is ginger. And in particular, he wants you to use fresh ginger juice as a major antiviral. So we can grow ginger to have fresh roots to juice. And what you want to do is just go to the grocery store. If you're going to the grocery store, uh, wear your mask and buy a nice plump uh, ginger root. Don't get the all shriveled up stuff. You want a nice fat one. And then you bring it home. You can cut it up into pieces. It's got all these knobby ends and each one of those ends can potentially make a new plant. And you can cut it. If you're going to cut it up, you can cut it up and let it callous overnight. And then you want to soak it in warm water to get it going. It needs some warmth to get started. And then plant it about an inch deep in some really, really rich soil. And keep it in the warmest possible place that you can. And it'll get going. Sometimes it takes it two or three weeks to get going, depending on how much heat you can put to it. And then it grows pretty fast. You can get some pretty good, you know, out of a little hunk, you can get a pretty good sized root in just one summer. Uh, so that's something we can work on. And it's the fresh juice that's wanted. So you either need to have a, a juicer or you can grate it and then and you need some way to squeeze it out. Joe, uh, I have a question about that. Um, yes. How long do you soak it in the warm water? Uh, just overnight, I believe. Overnight. Okay. I just looked it up yesterday online. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and that's what they said. And Joe, that actually makes me think. Um, I've tried to juice it in a juicer, and boy, that was <laughs> not very satisfying. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. It just, I mean, the fiber just totally bunked up, bunged up the juicer where the juice is supposed to go through because it's mm. so fibrous, you know? Okay. Um, and so I don't, I'm wondering. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I would just, my inclination would be to grate it, and then I do have a really good squeeze kind of thing. That I, I think use. that's probably a better thing. And I'm wondering if warming it would help it to get more of the juice to come out. Usually things, if they're warm, they expand a little. Uh, well, yeah, that sounds very logical to me. We yeah. have two and a half minutes. Yeah. And then in, in, if all else fails, the other thing you could do is mix it with a little water and bring it to a boil and then squeeze that out, you know, get more juice out that way. Because what you really want is, is not necessarily the pure juice, but something that's about half pure juice and half water. The pure juice is pretty killer, really. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we got about two minutes until our uh, our session ends. So I okay, just want to so let you know if you want to wrap it up. Yep. Yeah, so uh, we're going to run down these really quick. This is one called Hutinia. It's a horrible weed in my garden, but it happens to be a famous antiviral. It's a very popular food in China and Southeast Asia. Uh, it's easy to get a hold of. If you can't find that, I can send you some roots of it. It is invasive and it is really hard to get rid of. So you want to either plant it in a container or in a place on your land that's already really weedy and you don't care. So just add another weed in. Uh, but that's the third one. Uh, Isotis is something we can all grow. It's a famous antiviral in Chinese medicine, both the root 
Ban Lan Gun and the top dot Ching Ye. And it's just a biennial. You can get seeds and grow it this year and get a harvest this fall. It's called Woad, W-O-A-D. It's a famous blue dye. So that's something else that we can jump in there on. Licorice is another one. If you can get a hold of a plant, getting it started from seed is a little bit complicated. Um, so those are just some of the things that we're working on. Another really important, there are others. We could go out and gather kudzu. It's a little late now. We could go out and gather Japanese knotweed, one of the most invasive plants known, which is very, very uh, strongly antiviral. Uh, there's a tree called red root. Anyway, there'll be more of this stuff online, and hopefully we're going to do a little bit of a follow-up where we will answer your questions. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to get to uh, Thomas Guerin's list of – he listed some formulas, and you can listen to his talk on the American Herbalist Guild, and then he went into some possible American substitutes, like pleurisy root, et cetera. Uh, so check that out. So uh, one of the formulas that Garan talks about is uh, uh, modified che ge jie ji tang, uh, whatever that means. External pathogen attacking the exterior pathogen constrained with heat formation. And so this is early stage pathogenic toxin entering the lung upper burner. And his formula consists of uh, two cooling diaphoretics. So diaphoretics are herbs that make you sweat. Uh, so at the very earliest stages of catching a cold or flu, if you can make yourself sweat, you can often push it out and cure it overnight. You can I chime in there for yes. a moment? Um, when in that slide where I, I was talking about releasing the exterior, and right. we were talking about gua sha, that's, Sweating is part of that process. It's very important. Thank you for bringing it up, Joe. Good. Okay, yeah. Gua Sha is another one you can do at the same time. So there's, in Chinese medicine, there's invasion by wind heat, and there's invasion by wind cold. And for wind heat, you'd use cooling herbs, and for wind cold, you use warming herbs. It's always like this thing of balancing. Uh, so some cooling diaphoretics are kudzu root. For example, gagun. That's one of the ones that's in this formula. And the other one that's in this formula, cooling diaphoretic, is bupurum. And uh, so we can actually collect kudzu, although all roots are better collected when the plant is dormant. I don't know. Kudzu might even still be dormant today, probably not next week. I think it's a little bit late leafing out. And take along a pickaxe. If you're going to go out and try and collect some kudzu, you want the biggest roots you can find, and they're going to be pretty deep. It's going to be horrible, really. Uh, almost as bad as trying to collect Japanese knotweed, where even a pickaxe, I mean, you might be better off with a stick of dynamite if you want to, like, collect some Japanese knotweed. It's like this huge root that's hard as a rock. Uh, but still, you can pick away at it and bust off some pieces and, Knock them loose. It contains resveratrol, which is a famous anti-aging compound that's found in grape skins and grape seeds. Uh, so it's one of the worst invasive exotics in the whole world. There's some pretty cool websites showing pictures of Japanese knotweed growing out of rock walls and expressways and like everywhere. It's just like flourishing like crazy in our and world. Joe, I want to put a little warning in there. Um, I just went and dug it and um, Got a fair amount. I was fortunate that the plants, I guess, had been disturbed enough that I didn't have that giant root. I was able to big up, take up clumps and then get the active orange root off of it. But our, our co-worker, Greta Dietrich, is our herbalist. And I said, this is just incredible to clean. She said, just give it to me. I'll clean it. And I'll process it all. And then she said, you know, I found a bunch of other roots that are not Japanese knotweed. And then the next day, she said, guess what they are? And they're poison ivy. And she's highly allergic. So be they very aware of what it's it. growing with, you know. They had mingled into the... Yep, yep, totally. Uh, yeah, yeah well, I, and, I could see how that could happen, for sure. Yeah, especially with this heavy gumbo mud that was just all, you know, I couldn't uh -huh. get these clumps to come apart. So just be yeah, aware. Really good, yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah. point, for sure. Yeah. I never would have thought of that. Yeah, well, we didn't uh, until too late. <laughs> so, uh, so Garrett is trying to give us uh, possible Western substitutes. As I said, you can listen to this lecture online. He's saying that for bupurum, uh, we could maybe use 
uh, touristy route, Asclepias tuberosa, which is the orange flowered milkweed that you see along roadsides about in July. It's a very, very pretty wildflower, usually called butterfly weed. It has a very deep root. Uh, it's a bit of digging to get that up as well, but that's one he suggests. He suggests as a possible substitute for kudzu to use uh, elder. And he doesn't really specify what part. Most of the books that talk about elder are talking about the fruit. It's like a major thing that people use for the flu is elderberry syrup. Uh, and people also use the flowers in various ways, including making fritters out of them. They're very nice. And they make lots of drinks, uh, like slightly alcoholic drinks in Europe, elderberry flowers and apple juice and this and that, you know, cordials. Very tasty, but Buner's saying he doesn't think that the fruit or the flowers is strong enough really to combat the virus. So you really need to go with the leaves or the bark. Uh, so carrying on here a little bit, the, the second part of this formula is the warming diaphoretics. And there's two of them, Chiang Huo, Notopterygium and Sizum, and Bai Jur, Angelica de Hurica. And he's Suggesting that different angelicas might uh, substitute for the notopterygium, different wild angelicas. But he doesn't really have a substitute for the angelica de hurica by Jur, which is used a lot for nasal congestion. So the Chinese have a bunch of different angelicas that are for different purposes. Uh, the most famous one is Dongwei, which is called women's ginseng. It's like a blood tonic, blood mover. This one has nothing to do with that that I know of. I mean, maybe in some way it does, but basically this one is about nasal congestion. And the third one, which I'm blanking on at the moment, is for uh, wind damp conditions like rheumatism, duho. Uh, so there's a lot of different angelicas and they seem to do a lot of different things. And the big Western one, Angelica Archangela, is primarily thought of as a digestive tonic actually. But this Baijur, we actually got a lot of it. It's kind of a weed in my garden. So uh, if anybody's very keen to get a hold of this Baijur herb, uh, we could probably try and dig up some small ones and send them to you. We do this uh, bare root male thing. So he's got a bunch of cooling herbs in here. So it kind of goes through and analyzes the formula. It's very uh, interesting. Uh, licorice is cooling. And also there's a mineral being used in this formula called gypsum. Uh, there's gypsum again, Sh Sh Shiga, uh, which is a mineral. Uh, I think it goes into uh, cement, if I'm not mistaken. And then another pair is forsythia flowers, the so Lian Chao and uh, Isatis, the woad, which I mentioned. And he's suggesting as a possible substitute for the forsythia that we could use echinacea or possibly thyme. Thyme and oregano and a number of these Mediterranean herbs do go to the lungs and are very good that way. And one way to, you know, sometimes people want to, you can inhale the essential oils, put them into a pan of hot water and put a towel over your head and just breathe the essential oils of oregano and thyme and things like that. That's very good. Uh, Scrofularia, Xuanxian versus the Scutellaria bicolensis. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have a, Good suggested substitute for the Scutellaria bicolensis. Scrofularia, we have a native plant called figwort, which is closely related, which we can use. So, and then his second formula, pathogenic heat obstructing the lung pattern, fever with body temperature. This is when you're actually catching the disease. These others have been like prevention or the very earliest stages. So. As you get further into it, then the formulas get a lot more complicated. Uh, he's suggesting rosemary. Uh, another important herb they use, Xing Ren, is apricot seed. He's suggesting cherry bark, which has been used for coughs. That would be a good possible substitute that we could investigate. Uh, some other herbs that he mentions that would be very handy for these uh, diseases. Elecampane is a good herb for lungs. Pretty easy to grow, easy to come by. Echinacea would be a good one. Hyssop is a good one. Makes a very nice tea that's in the mint family. And Grindelia, also known as gumweed. So these are all, whorehound is another one. Quite easy to grow. Also likes a rather dry place. Kind of furry leaves. It's almost a little bit in some ways like mullen. 
so these are all some herbs that we could be growing for ourselves. Uh, Huang Chin, so other herbs that are mentioned both in the herbal antivirals book and in a lot of the formulas. Uh, Don Shen is another one that pops up quite a bit. That's a salvia uh, miltyriza, red rooted sage. And that's pretty easy to grow, but once again, it'd probably be like two or three years for harvest. Most of these Chinese herbs, where you're using the root, they need to be several years old, like astragalus. Not hard to grow from seed. You can almost just direct sow it if you've got good fresh seed. But it's going to be like a three-year wait to harvest it. I mean, that's not to say that we shouldn't get it going, because I'm not sure these viruses are going to be disappearing in three years. They might still be around. Um, Joe, what about to, um, uh, the, um, the milkweed, that, the pleurisy root? Is that also three years before you harvest? Uh, probably. Yeah, for guess, at least two. But we can go out and harvest out of the wild. Yeah, I wouldn't want to Unfortunately, take the place we tend mostly to see these herbs is on the roadside, because that's right. <laughs> how we get out and about, is in our cars. Yep. Uh, yep. But they are out in fields. It, it, does okay with pretty crappy soil, like a hard clay. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so maybe get out on some back roads. And if you harvest it, it's a very deep root. And if you dig it, you're more likely not going to get all the way to the bottom. And then it'll grow back from the piece that you left in there. Which is good to know. <laughs> you know? Well, that could be a strategy. You're not, you're not really extinguishing it. Right. Hmm? Yeah. That could be a strategy. You could purposely not go super deep. So you were getting right. some, but letting the plant come back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, stragulus, and I mentioned the reishi mushroom as being a really good one that we can get out and collect pretty soon. Hey, what else we got there? Official Chinese formula for the treatment of COVID is Ching Fei Pai Du Tang, and then it's got honey treated licorice, and it's got this apricot seed. Shigao was the uh, gypsum. Guajer is cinnamon twig. Zushia, alisma, that's something we grow and can provide planting material. Zhuling is the mayataki mushroom, I believe. Baiju is a tractalus that I said I have trouble growing. Chaihu, bupleurum is the one he said a uh, the uh, pleurisy root could be a substitute for. Wang Chin was the Chinese scutellaria. That's very problematic. Ban Sha is another famous herb for the lungs. It's a horrible weed in my garden. It's all over the place. But the issue is it has to be detoxified, either with ginger juice or with lime. You can't use it raw. It's Jack in the Pulpit family, and almost everything in there has got some toxicity, and you've got to neutralize it. Uh, Zawan is in here. That's a Chinese aster, quite a weedy little plant that we can provide starts of if anybody wants it. And that's something we could get a harvest off of in one year. That's used a lot for coughs in Chinese medicine. Fresh ginger, he mentions. Quandong uh, Hua is colt's foot, which a lot of Western herbalists have backed off from colt's foot because of the pyrrolidazine alkaloids. Same problem that's in comfy root. Uh, but the Chinese use the flower buds. So my suspicion is that the flower buds, like why would you go to the trouble of collecting flower buds when you could collect these great huge leaves, right? It's just way easier to collect the leaves. So why are they using the buds? Well, they, they must think they're strong, but maybe they also have some intuition that they are lacking or less uh, encumbered by these pyrrolidazine alkaloids. But colt's foot is out there. It's blooming right now. It's one of the very first things that blooms right at the same time as daffodils. And the flower buds are, the flowers and flower buds are on a separate stalk. And it's little yellow flowers with like a million petals. Uh, not like a dandelion, but just like a daisy with all these very thin petals. Followed by puffball like a uh, dandelion. And then the leaf comes separate a little bit later on. The leaves are not up yet. You see it on roadsides. <laughs> there we go again. Uh, but it's not only on roadsides, but moist uh, places in more or less full sun. When we had a landslide on my creek out here and all the vegetation was erased, the f almost the first thing that came in was colt's foot. Now there's none of it left. It's all been shaded out. Uh, Shigun, that's Bellum Kanda. Shishin, a good substitute for that might be our native wild ginger. It certainly looks identical in the pictures. 
Shan Yao is Dioscorea batatus. It's the uh, air potato vine. It's quite an invasive exotic in lots of parts of the country and uh, many parts of Asheville. I could go into Asheville and just kind of drive around at random and collect a bushel of uh, Shan Yao bulblets in an afternoon. It's everywhere. It's up every little back road, every little lot that hasn't yet been developed for housing is overrun with Shan Yao. Uh, Dioscorea batata. So you can look online. It's a nice kind of heart-shaped leaf. A very good edible. And also uh, Rudolf Steiner said it would be the most important food of the 21st century. His followers call it light root. Interesting plant to know about. What is the, the common name of it here? That we uh, Well, a lot of people call it ear potato vine. Some people also call it cinnamon vine because when it flowers, it's very, very fragrant and it smells like kind of like cinnamon, but that won't be until uh, midsummer. It's all over. It makes these little, it's called air potato vine because it makes these little tiny tubers all up the stem and you can eat them and they'll fall down and every one of them will grow. So then you get these kind of wild tangles of all these vines growing up together. Uh, because they're pretty much guaranteed, every one of them that falls on the ground is almost guaranteed to grow. Uh, from that perspective, it's a little bit uh, like you need to give some thought if you want to grow this plant uh, <laughs> that is not going to take over your garden. Uh, but yeah, Shan Yao is the Chinese name. Dioscorea batatus, that's an obsolete name, but that's the name that's out there everywhere. Or Dioscorea apposita. So it's a true yam. It's not what people in the South called yams, which is sweet potatoes. This is not a sweet potato. It's a true yam related to uh, the yams that are stapled. Much of the tropics staple food is yams all over Polynesia, big parts of Africa. But this is the only yam that's actually hardy in our area. So Joe, is it the root that you use for medicine? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of issues there around harvest because it's very deep and it's very uh, tender and hard to dig up. Uh, you can't pull it up. You've got to dig it up. And it's about the size of a baseball bat and it grows straight down. Um, but people are eating the uh, aerial bulbless, which I don't know, in my mind, they should be more or less identical tissue to what's in the root. Um, but they don't seem to, the Chinese think would have figured that out, and they don't seem to use the bulbets as medicine, so I don't really know. But the story is there. But people are using them for food, for sure. Uh, then we've got a couple of citrus peels. There's a bunch of different citruses in Chinese medicine just to keep the qi moving. Zhushu and Chen Pi, and then we've got Huoshang, which is the last one on here, and that's, uh, that's anise hyssop. That's something we can grow. That's very good for uh, food stagnation and moving the chi around and promoting the appetite. And that's easily grown. You could probably grow it as an annual, like a stashi rugosa, or I think the uh, anise hyssop, like a stashi funiculum is more or less identical. It'd probably be used interchangeably. The, the main herb is actually patchouli, but that's tropical. So this is the Northern Huoshang is agastashi. So that is the official Chinese formula for the treatment of COVID. And you can find that online. And then Buner, as I said, has his main, I'm just going to keep talking, right? <laughs> if you want me to. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm Buner, wondering uh, if, I, if I can jump in because I have to jump off, which I'm sure. so sorry I have to, I have to go. But yes. Joe, you brought up a couple of things that I just want to circle back on. Please. Um, one is you have just laid out this beautiful variety of herbal allies that we have to help us through this time and the depth of intelligence that those plants have. As you mentioned, there are multiple constituents in each herb that used together are kind of like this shotgun approach instead of like the silver bullet of what you know, right. pharmacology is, is trying to create. Um, and then the incredible intelligence of the virus, how adaptable the virus is and how adaptable we, we have to meet it in its adaptability. 
And it just seems like the plant kingdom is so, it's so perfect for that, to, to meet one intelligence with another. <laughs> yes. And right. how nature has that all figured out. I mean, they, they have already this relational experience with each other. So just w- want to say thank you for your immense knowledge and all the work that you've done over the years to study plants and to bring this information to us. We are so fortunate to have you. I just want to thank you for that. And um, the other point I want to make um, that you also brought up, how the Chinese have such an experience, this wealth of knowledge of using herbal intelligence and understanding the intelligence and respecting the intelligence of pathogens. Um, such a long history in dealing with pandemics. And one of, the, um, one of the things that sticks in my mind from the king of Chinese medicine, who is Sun Sun Yao, the importance of adaptability in dealing with viruses that even as a practitioner of herbal medicine, you don't just want to give one, rely on one formula or one set of herbs. You want to you want to mix them. You want to have the adaptability to mix the formulas to address the specific symptoms that the patient is having. And it, in terms of prevention, it's also helpful to mix, to, to shift the formulas. So my teacher spoke about it as confusing the pathogen. So maybe one day you're drinking a bunch of peppermint tea and the next day you're drinking a bunch of perilla leaf tea and the next day you're using a different set of herbs that all relate to that pathogen, but to keep it on its toes that it can't adapt to what you're giving it and then create a resistance to it. That's Um, great. Yes. So yeah, I just want to thank you so much. I think so. One more question for you before you go. Uh, um, because I kind of did just get this paper about this, you know, Western medicine s- treatment that's successful. It's basically high doses is a vitamin C um, early on and then steroids to keep the immune system from overreacting. And I remember when you were treating me for something and you said, hylochrysum, that is, that is the Chinese um, solution to that, to that need. Would you think that might be appropriate for, the, for what they're trying to accomplish there? Uh, that's a, that's a huge question that I, I wouldn't want to answer that. <laughs> okay. All right. Right here, right now, maybe we could address it. Um, and in another way, because I work with helichrysum only as an essential oil. So that would, uh-huh. that could be a whole other conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, I think what Joe is bringing up the intelligence of using the plant kingdom using corticosteroids for this is not proving to be a very good strategy. So um, we having the plants on our side is really, we're so lucky that we, not, not that this is a war. I mean, I think this is all about nature's intelligence and finding a balance. And Joe, you even mentioned, this is part of our human evolution. We're learning, you know, the plants and the virus, they're helping us evolve. So if we can, if we can work on it together, I think that's, that's a great strategy. So maybe we can talk about essential oils another time. Um, and Joe, you were going to say something before Patrick chimed in, and I just wanted to, to see if there was something you Well, wanted. I was just going to thank you for being part of our team, because <laughs> if we do get past uh, immune boosting stage and start getting sick, then the Chinese have all these different formulas for the different stages of the advancement of the disease. And that's where a practitioner like Margo comes in. That's where I'm no use at all. Uh, I can't read the signs and tell you which uh, formula, what stage you're at. And these stages apparently come along really quick. Like Mm -hmm. like one formula is appropriate today and it's going to be a different formula tomorrow. And you need to be right on top of it. So Yeah, and uh, sometimes even within the same day. It's yeah. progressing very, so very rapidly. It'd be good for everyone to line up a Chinese practitioner. Yes. Um, and Margaret, she's overloaded. <laughs> right. Yeah. And to start early because 
we have a supply chain coming from China. We have a limited amount of people growing these herbs here in America. And if, again, if we can get ourselves supplied with the preventives or the early stage medicines, that's, you will be helping your practitioner out immensely if you have those things on your shelf that when you contact your practitioner and say, here's what's going on for me, they can say, it's time to reach for the jade screen or grab that guguntang or whatever, start gua shying, that you, you have some understanding of what, what you might be asked to do and that you have the herbs that you need. That's, I think that's really important. Prevention, an ounce of prevention right. is worth 10,000 pounds of cure. <laughs> So. Um, yes, and that's a very, very good point about uh, uh, rotating your preventive medicine. So we're making the jade screen, but you can also buy all of these online. You know, you don't have to, and I'm not mailing out tinctures. I'm right. sorry, just don't ask me. I'm just trying to supply my neighborhood. But all this stuff's available online. I don't think the pills are sold out at this point in the game. Jade screen, then we've got the kudzu formula, Gigantau. I think you're pretty sure you can find that online. We've got the defense energy or the cinnamon twig formula. That's a good one, especially if you're feeling kind of chilled, a wet, cold, windy sort of a day. Uh, we've got the astragalus immunity formula, which is made by Seven Forests. That's the same ITM online that I mentioned a while back. Uh, I think you can find that on Amazon. I might call it astragalus 14 or something like that. Uh, that would be another really good one that you can use. You can also put yourself together the mixture that uh, that uh, Buna really favors, which is three herbs, cordyceps, um, cordyceps, rhodiola, oh, cordyceps, rhodiola, what's the other one, astragalus, or is it... Uh, Cordyceps, astragalus, and rhodiola. Yeah, that's his three big favorites. So astragalus is very easy to come by online. And probably rhodiola and cordyceps as well. These have gotten very well known. I'm sure they're all over Amazon. Uh, so those are the really helpful, uh, like rhodiola is used to help people adapt to high altitudes. It grows in Tibet and places like that. So that's just basically what all that's saying is, Open up your lungs so you can get in more air, which is like exactly the issue with uh, when your lungs are being attacked by the coronavirus. So, yeah. so these well, are all things. And the jade screen, like I mentioned, you could you could get yourself three or four of them and take it, different ones every day. That would be great. I got these thunder pearls that Margot recommended, so I'm alternating with that. It's uh, manufactured by Classical Pearls a very highly respected uh, Chinese medicine company. I don't know if these can be purchased by non-practitioners or not. No, probably not. Okay. Uh, not all of this stuff can be gotten that way. And the Shuang Huang Lian. I mentioned that's another one that we can be taking for immunity. And then the uh, Forsythia and uh, Harisong, Lian Chiao. That's a famous... Uh, uh, formula for early stages of colds and so you could rotate that in if you wanted to kind of what do you think Margot would that be a good one for prevention or is that more when you're already sick the yin chow formula yeah yeah I'm not a big fan of that formula so I would I would use it if a uh, sore throat had already set in I would okay. I would I would hold off on that one just because it's so cold I mean it's not cold mm. but it's it's cooling okay. and Initial stage, um, remember you want your resources and one of them is chi and you're young. You want to have that to meet the, 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 the wind. So we don't want to get, we don't want to cool ourselves off unless it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Those things are warm. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to say bye-bye. Okay. Thanks okay. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just uh, quickly, I would wind up to go over this. Uh, so, so Stephen Buhner says his main thing that he wants to use is a Shuang Huang Lian, Honeysuckle for Scythia and Huang Lian, Gold Thread, Coptus. But then he's got three formulas that you can take 
along with that to supplement it. How does he describe it here? This paper is very good. I would suggest that herbal treatments for coronavirus. Uh, I would suggest that everybody want, might want to download that and check it out. Suggestive protocols, general protective, Shuang Huang Lian formulation. This was found in the earlier SARS outbreak in China to help considerably. Uh, now being tested in clinical trials for COVID, for Scythia, Linusera, Scutellaria. One part of two parts for Scythia, one Linusera, one Scutellaria. Then, then he's got three formulas to go along with it. Core formulation, so that's Scutellaria bicolensis, the Huang Chin, and then Japanese knotweed, two parts, and then two parts of kudzu, uh, one part of licorice, and one part of decocted elderberry leaf tincture. So we can make almost all of that, except unfortunately for the Huang Chin, which is the main herb in the formula, but all the rest of it we could have available. We just ordered a pound of licorice from Mountain Rose, just to be sure we had enough on hand. Then his second one, which he calls immune formulation, is three parts of cordyceps, two parts of Dongwe, Angelica sinensis, one part of rhodiola, one part of astragalus. So Angelica sinensis is the uh, Dongwe, the big women's herb in Chinese medicine. Cordyceps is a little mushroom that grows off of a uh, insect and it costs a fortune, but now they've figured out how to grow it on grain. So it's not all that expensive. A good source for mushroom stuff is Paul Stamets. Uh, he makes really excellent products and I think he's got a Cordyceps product. If I'm not mistaken, they just grow the mycelium on grain. Uh, but that would be widely available online. And then the third one, cellular protection, cytokine modulation, spleen lymph support. There's this whole thing about cytokine storms, which I'm not going to go into at all. Uh, you know, addresses it at length. But it's basically the idea that your body can overreact and pump out too many uh, things to try and combat the invading thing. And, and the overreaction is actually what turns out to be fatal. This one is Danshen, the salvia, the Chinese salvia. Two parts of red root, which is a plant that is around in the environment. It's all up and down the highways in South Toe Valley. Uh, once again, you need to get out and find some place to collect that. That's not right next to the road. But that's actually a little late. You should have gotten that in the winter, unfortunately, when the roots are red. In the summer, they apparently lose their red color. And then Biden's pelosa, which is quite a uh, weed. Uh, it's not too hard to find. It's an annual weed. It's got a lot of uh, immune boosting properties and you could look online and get some uh, pictures of it. It's used all over the world. It's also a big herb in Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, both Biden's Pelosa. I don't know of, of a good common name for it. Uh, but those are his three uh, extra formulas that go on. So these are some of the things we can do, some of the things we can uh, grow and be working with. And, things that we are producing for uh, our neighborhood and other people can produce them for their neighborhood. As I say, uh, if you go online to my website and look on my blog, I think you'll find this little two page report adaptogens and immune boosting herbs, which is pretty much everything that I just uh, went over. Uh, written down, woad, hutinia, ginger, yeah, all these things that we can grow or collect. Good. Well, thank you very much. I had a one last question for you, Joe. Yes. Um, and it's probably not, but I just wondered because I know it's medicinal and it's so abundant. Do you think there's any role, role, role for Sto Chan in this, in this time? Well, my friend Dave and Janet use it interchangeably with echinacea. Uh, and in fact, it used to be an echinacea. Like they were split apart, the Rudbeckias and the echinaceas. They were formerly all one genus. They put the yellow ones over here and the pink ones over here or something like that. But they think it's every good, a bit as good as echinacea. So yeah, I would say uh, probably. Um, for medicinal purposes, it might conceivably be the root that you would want to use rather than the leaf, which is good to eat. And probably, mm -hmm. giving, you know, all these wild foods are giving you something good. No question mm -hmm. about it. Well, and normally people like Zeb, who are real promoters of it, say you should like cook it and toss off the water and then cook it more um, 
because you don't want that medicine that's in it all the time. But at this point, maybe that's not as important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Cherokees seem to have had a way of cooking everything to death from our standards. You know, but, <laughs> but it does, uh, it is a lot more uh, appetizing as food when it is what we would call overcooked. <laughs> But maybe you should just put up with it being not quite as delicious, and maybe it's being a little more medicinal. I think you're right. I think you could probably we could figure out recipes to work with the flavor that it has. Actually, you know, you just mm -hmm. would want to probably use some of Margot's warming spices with it. You know. Yeah. And they probably would mask that flavor, which I actually like. But I know a lot of people don't. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. Um, I certainly All have right. loads more questions. Good. Well, I hope I can answer them. And, and I'll I be just, talking to you about getting a bunch of your plants. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, I want to reiterate Joe's website, mountaingardensherbs.com, because that's great. And thank you for all those other great websites, Joe. And we'll try to put links to all that when we sure. post this. And Lisa, another resource where Margo does a much more extensive demonstration of Guash. Guashan, is that, that? Yeah, Guashan, uh-huh. Is the um, natural cold care that she did. Right, yeah, we have the whole video on that where Margot talks about that and, and all of this whole this whole topic. Well, Joe, it's been great. We finally got you on uh, something here with Living Web Farms. I'm so glad you're here today and with us. As always, I love your place. I started going there many years ago and long before Living Web happened, and I'm glad you're still here with us to share all this great wisdom and insight. So it's, it's definitely a world to navigate and we need your help. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're all set. Thank you. And we look forward to having another interesting session like this very soon here. All right. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Talk to you okay. soon, Pat. Okay. All right. Cheerio. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Bye.